every week we get about a 220 cases of abuse in Jamaica of children. We cleared a backlog last year of 4,000 cases, and that doesn't have to do with the daily cases. That's just a backlog. And we have another 3,000 in our backlog to deal with. So between the backlog and the new cases coming on, we've had to increase our investigators by six every year. So we're now up to about um, 24 child investigators because a lot of the time now is, has to be dealing with investigating child abuse. And there are certain parishes which are where it is very clear that this is becoming a pattern and that it has become a culture ingrained in certain communities. Another thing that we're seeing is incest in certain parishes. So that's the first issue that we have to combat. The second one, though, is dealing with the children when they go through this kind of abuse and, and now having to counsel. And that is difficult because many of them get into very, very difficult circumstances mentally and emotionally. We have a system of justice in this country where even though we have made amends for children to give evidence and not have to go to court, one of the things why we can't get convictions oftentimes is because the families are not prepared to come forward and give the statements in the end. And you need statements to make convictions. You need evidence. Apart from the procedural issues in law, you need the evidence to be able to do it and to convict the person. So oftentimes people are charged, but they go off and they get off because there is still a culture of silence in this country. What I would have to say that I'm very pleased about is our improvements in child reporting. Over the last two years, we have really ramped up how we advise the public on how to report. So we have 1888 Protect. We have you know, the internet, you can call, there are billboards, and I think I would have to say that a, a true test of it has been the Ananda Alert system, which we've added more resources to. So now we've been able to return nine out of every 10 children that have gone missing. And that has been a significant improvement over the last two years. The first thing that we did was we put in place a mobile health clinic. We got some funds from UNICEF and we got some funds from the United, um, the European Union, and we outfitted and retrofitted a, a bus that has a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, a driver, and that visits the Southeast region and meets with those children, counsels them, gives them the medication if necessary. And then we got a grant from JSIF for about $60 million because we need to build what is called a therapeutic center because a lot of these children don't need to be incarcerated. What they need is, is really love and, 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 and care, medical care or psychological care. We have seen about 4,000 cases last year of children who needed counseling. Um, we've had to refer several hundred of them to clinical psychologists and I'm to get another report very shortly about what our numbers are looking like for this year. So there is a lot of stress on Jamaican children and it, it's, it's manifesting itself in different ways. The other problem that we face is that a lot of, a lot of Jamaican parents don't recognize that how violence impacts the child's life. We're living in an environment where they're constantly here shouting and belittling and pushing and slapping and, and beating affects them. One of the things that I would like to see, certainly as a, a, a young politician and certainly as, as someone young in the process, is to be able to have discussions in this country which are based on data and not only driven by emotion and um, biblical scripture. Certainly what I believe in even politically and the ideologies that I believe in is certainly women should be empowered to take their decisions about their bodies 
um, about their own contraception. I certainly believe that women um, should be given that right. I don't think it is a state that should give, um, give veto power over a woman's body, especially if she's in, a, in, a, in harm's way. And the double standard that we have in this country is that persons who have money are able to get access to those facilities, whether illegally, and it would be illegally, and the, the poor are not able to do it. And so they get mutilated and botched by, by clinics that are, that are not satisfactory. They go onto the underground market and buy tablets that, that really harm them for the rest of their lives. And so it really should be the, to the discretion of the woman. Well, that's a position for the Ministry of Education. There's also another position um, coming up in terms of contraception uh, through the Ministry of Health, where we've been doing consultations with the Ministry of Health, because one of the things that we, you know, the age of consent for, for someone to have sex is 16. So when a 14-year-old goes to a clinic, for instance, and asks for contraception, the doctor by law has to, or the nurse by law has to say, where's your parent or where's your guardian? Typically, the child doesn't come back. The next time you perhaps see the child, the child is pregnant or has an STD. So there has been a number of consultations because the doctors have been agitating um, to review the legislation to see if it is that they can prescribe in certain instances contraception for persons who are under 16 who they verily believe are in harm's way because some of them don't even have access to a parent. So we're also reviewing that and looking at what those options are. The condoms in schools would perhaps fall under the same way. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go any further than to say that. But it's a consultation between education ourselves and, um, and the Ministry of Health. I realize that people were upset. And I, I really want to thank people who came out and voiced their opinion one way or the other. Because it's important, I think, for people to, to understand that we do live in a democracy and that public servants and persons have a, a, another life. And that certainly from where I sit, I don't want anybody to buck up who I am. This is who I am. This is, you know, I don't want you to, to find things out about me. I think I've grown up in the Jamaican space since I was 14. And people have known me since I was 14. Since I was doing Enter the Dojo on JBC, there was rapping on JBC, there was certainly the UN, there was then Miss World, then there was all kinds of things. I think Jamaica has seen me grow and they've seen who I am. And for me to now go and, and become and go into a closet and say, well, now that I am minister, you know, this is, I don't want you to see who I am, um, is, is not something that I would, I would do to the Jamaican people, one, and it's just not who I am. And I would feel very uncomfortable having to be in a position where I could not be myself. You know, the, I was written by, by the leadership of the Catholic Church. And as I said to them, um, and that they apologized. And as I said to them, I never took it as a personal indictment against me by the Catholic Church. And so I was never, I was never upset about his comments. Um, I think Father Ho Long is entitled to his opinion. We have very different opinions on a number of areas. And sometimes I think his emotional outbursts are clouded by some of those differences. So I respect the work that he does in terms of the poor. And I would like to still hold him in that way. And I would never. I'm not someone who takes things personally, so, and I will be going back to the beach.